Well, I have just been dry cleaned and I've got a new fuzzy sweater, so time for a little Jimmy Carter-esque fireside chat about our next topic, stress and the immune system. Now, if you hang out with scientists, you'll notice they have a very irritating tendency, which is they like big words. They like complicated words. They like multisyllabic words. They like them to substitute for much easier concepts. For example, there's a stress-related disease called idiopathic alopecia areata. What is it? It means you lose your hair for some mysterious reason. Idiopathic, instead of just saying, we don't know. So there's all sorts of these fancy terms, and back in those ancient days for which you feel nostalgia, words like endocrinology or neurobiology counted as those satisfyingly long words, but in recent years it hasn't been enough. And you get even longer terms, and suddenly this is this world of psychoendocrinology or behavioral socioendocrinology or neuroeconomics or, I kid you not, something called neuromarketing. And amid all of that, there's been another multisyllabic term, a brand new field, which has emerged somewhere since the 1980s. And this one will dominate this lecture. This one has some of the most syllables around. This one is called psychoneuroimmunology. And the basic premise here is what's going on in your head, what your psychological state is, has something to do with how your immune system functions, how you fight off infectious diseases. Now, the evidence that something as bizarre as what's happening in your head can influence your immune system, something like that, in fact, goes back quite a few centuries. And the first evidence for this was this wonderful study back in the 1800s, and I wish I knew who had the intuition to do this, but you take people back when with a rose allergy, And you get an 1800s version of an artificial rose, probably not plastic, and you wave it in front of one of these people's noses, and they suddenly start sneezing. Not because this was a real rose, but because of psychoneuroimmunology kicking in, their immune system, their inflammatory system in this case, got tricked into starting to sneeze. Or another more recent study, another wonderful example of how this system works, and this was a study done with professional actors, and what they did was spend a day reading through a scene, practicing a scene that had some sort of horrible, catastrophic event in it, and a few days later, they spent the day reading through a scene that had some wonderful, buoyant news in it, And what do the scientists observe? Spend a day pretending that you are in the middle of some horrible, distressing, disastrous scene, and by the end of the day, your immune system is not working quite as well. Sit there and spend a day reading about some euphoric scene that you're acting your way through, and by the end of the day, your immune system is working a little bit better. Not surprisingly at all, this was carried out at UCLA, sitting there in Los Angeles, and no shortage of actors who were willing to have their immune systems futzed with, but this is the sort of informal evidence that this field, this psychoneuroimmunology, is for real. So how does this work? And especially, how does stress impact the system? Now, to appreciate this, we have to have a little bit of an overview of how the immune system works. And I know in this day and age, it's very important to do something confessional, so I will confess here, I am terrified of the immune system. I have felt that way since kindergarten because it is unbelievably complicated. So if you don't panic, I will try not to, as well as we go over the basics of the immune system. What the immune system does is protect you from pathogens, invasive thingies that don't belong in your body that could make you sick, most broadly bacteria and viruses. Viruses that are especially clever, what they can do is insert into your DNA, insert their viral DNA, and use that to take over your cells for their own nefarious purposes. The immune system's job is to constantly be on the lookout for bacteria and viruses, and when they spot them, to quick mount an attack. The immune system is also built around attacking cancerous cells, the starts of tumors, but the main thing they're about is going after invasive pathogens. And this is done in wildly complicated ways. 
What you see is, for one thing, all sorts of subtypes of immune cells that activate the system and suppress the system and activate the suppressors and suppress the actor. They come with all sorts of names. There's even like tough guy immune cells, like called natural killer cells. There's a whole array of different types of immune cells. Broadly, there's two categories of immune cells, white blood cells, lymphocytes. Broadly, there's two categories having to do with two different functions, two different origins. Now, the immune system, new cells are made in various places, new immune cells. They're made in your bone marrow. Some are made in your thymus gland. Others are made in your spleen, your lymph nodes. So broadly, there are these two classes, T cells and B cells. T cells, originate in the thymus. B cells originate, mature in the bone marrow. Very simplified version here for our purposes. Now what T cells and B cells do are very different things. What does a B cell do? It is constantly surveying your body to look for those pathogens. And what happens when it encounters one of them? It has this brilliant capacity to recognize what doesn't belong there. And when encountering one of these things, it starts to make antibodies that are specific to this pathogen, antibodies that will recognize this pathogen. And what those antibodies do is help to activate the T cell immune response, which is a whole bunch of these T cells to home in on whatever this pathogen is and blow it to smithereens. Now naturally, pathogens aren't just sitting there passively getting blown in by the immune system. And just as the immune system evolved to be fancier, pathogens evolved to have fancier defenses against the fancy immune system, what might be termed co-evolution. So you see all sorts of vicious tricks. There's this bacteria, this tropical one called trypanosomes, a parasite. And what trypanosomes are able to do is they keep switching proteins on their surface, the sort of proteins that B cells would home in on to make antibodies. So you've got some trypanosome protein on the surface there. B cells spot it, doesn't belong there, start making antibodies. And just in time to attack those trypanosomes, the, tra the trypanosomes have put in new different proteins. And the immune system can't find it. Very complicated coevolutionary battles. So what you find are the two basic features of what's called the adaptive immune system, the fancy stuff, T cells and B cells. Then there is this ancient, ancient part of the immune system, which refers to innate immunity. This is ancient like bits and pieces of innate immunity have been found in insects of that sort. What B cells and T cells are about is specifying going after some specific pathogen. What innate immunity is about, innate immunity is all about inflammation. It just kicks in any sort of infection, any sort of injury, and you just kick into action there with your innate immunity. And this is not two weeks later making your antibodies. This is you get a cut and you get inflammation there being all set to attack any bugs that get in there through your injury. So we've got the fancy top of the line adaptive immunity, T cells and B cells. And then we've got these simplistic first ones in there, inflammatory response, innate immunity. So what does stress do superimposed on this? The first thing that happens, which was brought up in the very first lecture is with the onset of stress, you activate the immune system. Particularly, you begin to activate that innate immunity. How do you do this? Not surprisingly, you take advantage of the fastest part of your immune system, the innate stress response, and you take advantage of one of the fastest features of the stress response, the sympathetic nervous system. In addition, glucocorticoids in the very early phase of the stress response help to activate the immune system. And by now we see the perfect logic of it. You've had a tense meeting, your boss has ripped your innards open, dragging in the dust, blah, blah, and this is a good time to activate the immune system. This is what happens. Naturally, it is enormously complicated. And part of what you see is not only sympathetic nervous system and glucocorticoids activating 
the immune system, glucocorticoids also swoop in and do things like kill some of your old immune cells. So you sculpt out your immune response so that the ones that are on the scene are really critical. Some really nice work by Firdos Darbar at Stanford University showing another thing that happens during that time is the immune response takes circulating immune cells and rushes them over to wherever the injury is, what he has termed moving the soldiers from the barracks to the battlefront as quickly as possible. All of this highly, highly adaptive. So what happens, of course, with the problem of stress when it goes wrong? Now, the first thing that happens has to do with that short-term stress response and its short-term effects on immunity. What you begin to see is sometimes an increased risk of autoimmune diseases. Now, what is an autoimmune disease? As already noted, what's going on is your immune system is going throughout your body and looking for things that shouldn't be there. Pathogens, bacteria, viruses, all of that. Thus, what the immune system is brilliant at is telling the difference between, here's the jargon, self and non-self. Self, it belongs there. Non-self, you activate an immune attack, and it's going around and it says, you know, hemoglobin, part of us, good thing. Uh, virus, bad thing, nose, good thing. And what happens is it then attacks the stuff that isn't supposed to be there. What an autoimmune disease is about is your immune system screws up and decides that a part of you that absolutely is normal and should be there, in fact, is some invasive pathogen and attacks that part of your body. And there's a whole array of autoimmune diseases. And what you begin to see is a hint in the literature with the onset of stress, you activate the immune system. With the onset of lots of stressors where you activate the immune system over and over, you increase the likelihood of the immune system activating to the point of overactivating into autoimmunity. Thus, what you see is a relationship between lots of stress and flare-ups of autoimmune diseases. And where this has been seen most often in the literature is flare-ups, stress-related flare-ups of multiple sclerosis, which is a disease where your immune system is attacking part of your nervous system, where you have this autoimmune disease, rheumatoid arthritis, where it's attacking your joints, autoimmune disease, Graves' disease, where your immune system is attacking your thyroid gland, other ones as well. And what you have in all these cases is, with lots of stress, you increase the likelihood of spiraling into autoimmunity. Now, what you see is the evidence, very little evidence, that stress can actually cause these diseases, but what you see instead is that they increase the likelihood of a flare-up after you've gotten it. Not huge effects, but nonetheless, it's there in the literature. So what's going on with that? And what becomes relevant are, of course, glucocorticoids. Since they come in everywhere, glucocorticoids playing a very special role here. We've already heard they work with the sympathetic nervous system to cause that very rapid activation, but what they mostly do is something that takes a lot more time. So you've had this acute stressor and you activate your immune system, stressor is over with, and what you gotta do is coast the immune system back to where it came from recovery. And what glucocorticoids play a large role in is the recovery process. Just like in that earlier lecture, glucocorticoids during the recovery phase after a stressor increasing appetite, in this realm, glucocorticoids have something to do with mediating the immune stress response. They've got more to do with recovery from it. So that's great. But what if you've got a disease problem where you don't secrete glucocorticoids at that time? And this is an important transition because ad nauseum now we've been considering the circumstances where there's too much glucocorticoids. What if there's not enough now? And what you've got is what if you don't get that recovery going on quite as well? And what you would immediately predict is you may be getting into trouble there with an increased risk of autoimmunity. And a number of years back, an endocrinologist named Alan Monk of Dartmouth University, a titan in the field and a man who I deeply, deeply respect, came up with a fascinating theory, which was 
If you see disorders where you don't secrete enough glucocorticoids during stress, you see an increased risk of autoimmune disease. And this was viewed as wildly nutty and theoretical and implausible at the beginning. And research since then have shown, both in humans and in experimental subjects, animal subjects, that there are all sorts of circumstances where if you don't have the normal rise of glucocorticoids during stressors, the normal rise that will coast the system back to baseline, you increase the risk of the immune system spiraling out of, the, out of control into the realm of autoimmune disease. So we're suddenly in a very different realm here after the endless cases where you get in trouble because of an excess of glucocorticoids. Here, for the first time, we're dealing with what if you don't have enough glucocorticoids, enough of a stress response, you are prone towards autoimmunity, you are prone towards too much inflammation, just to mention a disease that I don't really want to go anywhere near, but where there's hints that this might be what's going on, fibromyalgia all sorts of inflammatory pain throughout the body. Nobody really knows what's going on, but one important thing that has popped up, there tend to be lower than normal glucocorticoid levels in people with fibromyalgia. So I'm not going anywhere closer to that. This is a very, very confused, unclear, controversial subject at this point. Okay, so we've got this picture here now of with the onset of stress, you activate the immune system, wonderfully adaptive. Not only are you generically activating innate immunity, that inflammatory stuff, but it's fancy, you're sculpting out old, grody, white blood cells, immune cells that aren't doing you much good under the circumstance. You're really focusing in on what's needed. You're mobilizing these cells to the injury site. All of that is great, and as we've just seen, if you don't secrete enough glucocorticoids, you are in danger of spiraling into autoimmunity. So we've got a vastly confusing point here because what we've just seen is not enough glucocorticoids, more at risk for autoimmunity. But a few minutes ago, we have lots of stress, parentheses, probably lots of glucocorticoids, and you're more at risk for autoimmune problems, autoimmune flare-ups. This seems rather contradictory and paradoxical, too much glucocorticoids, too little, and you've got autoimmune problems. Here's a very, very, very rough solution. And this has to do with that same point we had in the lecture about appetite. You say, I am chronically stressed 24-7, and as we saw, that's not chronic stress. Whole body burns are chronic stress. What we are saying when we say, oh, chronic stress, is a lot of those episodes of transient stressors, intermittent stressors. And what we saw with the appetite realm is that problem of you've got a lot of transient stressors and you've got a lot of periods of recovery. So what you wind up seeing is with just the right amount of these transient stressors, what you are beginning to bias towards is eventually not having the glucocorticoids doing exactly what they should be doing and perfectly and mediating that recovery period and you are in danger of spiraling into autoimmunity. And what you also see is get just the right pattern of an excess of glucocorticoids and you can get into the same trouble, immensely complicated field. And relevant to that, Hans Selye, that guy discussed in the second lecture and first lecture, the guy who's one of the founders of the whole field, Selye got as confused as everybody else as to what glucocorticoids are doing with the immune system and he made a massive mistake in the 1950s predicting how something was going to work with glucorticoids and immunity, and it's generally acknowledged that the sheer visibility of that massive mistake had a lot to do with the fact that he never got a Nobel Prize. This is tremendously complicated terrain. So what you see with excessive stress, not lots of the intermittent stressors, but majorly chronic stress, is something very different. Not only do glucocorticoids with each stressor get secreted and bring the immune system back to baseline, but with enough stress, you now have the immune system not only going back to baseline, but being suppressed below where it normally is. And you have this grave phenomenon of immunosuppression. Short-term stress, you enhance immunity. 
more sustained stress response after enhancing immunity, you return to baseline. Major league chronic stress and you actually suppress the immune system. And this goes back to, in fact, Selye in the 1930s once again, one of the first signs of stress-related disease. We heard the main, most famous one earlier on, which is stress increases the risk of ulcers. We now know how much more complicated that is, but stress and ulceration. You saw a second indication, or rather Selye spotted a second classical sign, which was chronically stressed animals got adrenal glands that were bigger. How come? Because they are working like crazy, pumping out epinephrine and pumping out glucorticoids. They're working more, they get bigger. But he noticed a third sign that was part of this trio of stress-related disease back in the founding years, which was an immune glands, like the thymus gland, shrink. They atrophy. So we had that first triad, ulcers, adrenal, hyperplasia, hypertrophy, and atrophy, shrinking of immune glands. And that absolutely reflects this whole phenomenon of chronic stress, and you are going to massively suppress the immune system. And you get things like the thymus. This is not a subtle effect. Just to give you a sense of this, have yourself a really awful, stressful three-day weekend, and you're going to come back at the end of it, and your thymus gland is going to be a quarter of the size it was on Friday. This is not subtle. This is like saying, oh, psychosocial stress, and I wipe out three out of the four chambers of my heart. These are big effects. And a lot of attention has gone into figuring out how this occurs, and it's glucocorticoids, and they, with chronic major league stress, they do all sorts of interesting things. One of the things they do, incredibly hot subject in this field, one that seems quite bizarre, is glucocorticoids kill some cells of the immune system, and how they do it is they turn on genes called suicide genes. They get the cells to do themselves in. There's a painfully fancy term for this process of cells committing suicide. It's called apoptosis. Don't write that down, but it's very, very trendy at this point. But we've got this general theme here. Acute stressor, you activate the immune system, more sustained, you go into the recovery phase of glucocorticoids bringing you back down to baseline, more sustained major league stressor, and now suddenly forget going back to baseline and you get profoundly immunosuppressed. And this begins to explain a very, very major piece of clinical medicine, which is when you've got an autoimmune disease, when you have an inflammatory disease, you want to give somebody glucocorticoids, not some piddly amount to kind of coast it back down to where you started from. Remember what an autoimmune disease is about is massive overactivity of the immune system. So the notion there is throw in boatloads of glucocorticoids so it's coming out the wazoo of this person, and what you take is this way overshoot of immune activity into autoimmunity, and you coast it back down. In other words, give somebody synthetic glucocorticoids and you may be able to do very helpful things for their autoimmune disease, their inflammatory disease. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about synthetic glucocorticoids, also known as corticosteroids. In the everyday sense, when somebody is, quote, put on steroids because of their MS, their rheumatoid arthritis, they're being given glucocorticoids. And we know some of these synthetic ones, hydrocortisone, prednisone, dexamethasone. What you're doing there is taking advantage of sledgehammer of a glucocorticoid dose, and you take this disease of overactive immunity, hyperinflammation, autoimmune attack, and you coast things back down to baseline. Just as a qualifier here, as a caveat, when talking about steroids in this case, these are not the androgenic steroids that get you thrown out of the Olympics. That's the world of testosterone. In this case, steroidal hormones, glucocorticoids are also steroidal. When somebody is taking steroids for their rheumatoid arthritis, they're taking synthetic glucocorticoid, huge doses that are bringing you back to baseline when things are too active. So we see this world where a little bit of glucocorticoids activates, 
the sort you get with transient stressors, a ton of the stuff, way more than your body ever generates during stress, and you can take an overactive immune system and bring it back down to baseline. So think about all the lectures that came before this and all the bad things that glucocorticoids can do when they're in excess, and what you wind up seeing is take these high doses of these synthetic glucocorticoids and you begin to get a lot of the problems that we've heard about in the prior lectures. You get a lot of side effects. Okay, so this very complicated world of stress and autoimmunity and immune suppression and the therapeutic use of synthetic glucocorticoids. Now, somewhere in there, though, you focus on that fact that sort of major stressors, not synthetic glucocorticoids, but major stressors, and you can get your immune system to the point of being suppressed below normal, and suddenly you have the cornerstone concept of psychoneuroimmunology, which is insofar as lots of stress can suppress immunity, lots of stress should impair your immune defenses. And now there's all sorts of infectious diseases that should mow you over. And what's known now a few decades into this field of psychoneuroimmunology is that's exactly how it works for the relatively boring stuff. For example, with chronic stress, the common cold becomes more common. And we all learned that anecdotally back in college where enough all-nighters right before exams and 30 seconds after you come out of your final, you come down with some horrible cold there. Chronic stress, increasing your risk of a cold, impairing your immune defenses against rhinoviruses, how you get nose colds. And this has been well studied in experimental settings and studying immune defenses against rhinovirus infection and the effects of stress on it. One of the most charming examples of how people have studied this was what used to be this research unit in England, their famed cold unit where volunteers would come and spend a couple of weeks at this idyllic sort of country club research facility where you can either wind up being a control or an experimental and no one would tell you which you were. And at some critical point, they would spritz up your nose, either some placebo or some spray full of rhinovirus, and then they look at various manipulations involving stress, involving stimulation, involve sociality, whatever, and see who gets the nose colds. And they would do, for the most part, very simple things and like wonderfully relaxing. Some of the folks got the lousy experiments where they had to, for example, test the hypothesis, does getting really cold, your body cold, impair your defenses against rhinovirus. They would make subjects stand out there and dump cold water on them while they're standing in their skivvies. And turns out the stressor of hypothermia increases the risk of a cold. Wonderfully insightful studies getting at the mechanisms by which chronic stress can increase your chances of a cold. This facility, this cold unit, was apparently wonderful. People would have a great time at them, unless they got the horrible nose cold standing there in the ice bucket. People would fight to get invited back there. More than one couple emerged from people being there at the same time, where they came back and honeymooned at the cold unit. People get some very surprising realms of pleasure out there. Okay, so chronic stress and the cold. Other realms, chronic stress and another world of viruses, viruses that infect us and then go latent. For example, herpes viruses. You get a herpes infection and you get a flare up and then it goes latent for a month, for 50 years. And what's known is one of the things that triggers herpes reactivation, sustained stress. And remarkably, this covers all sorts of realms in rats, social stress, radiation in humans, bereavement, all sorts of things like that. And you activate herpes viruses out of latency. This is brilliant on the part of herpes because what you want to do if you're herpes is take advantage of when the immune system is suppressed by stress. Quick, make a run for it, come out of latency, make lots of copies of yourself, and then go hide again. And remarkably, viruses like herpes virus, it's been discovered, can actually measure your glucocorticoid levels. That's amazing. So we've got stuff like chronic stress with psychoneuroimmunological canonical knowledge there. And 
It can increase your risk of a nose cold. It can increase your risk of a viral reactivation. How about some bigger stuff? How about, for example, an HIV infection? Somebody is infected with HIV and it is now transitioned to overt AIDS. And what's AIDS about? It's about declining immune function. If you are majorly stressed, does the immune system decline faster, more severely? The jury's out on that one. It looks as if certain personality types, when crossed with major stress, and you get an acceleration of that. But now we come to what is absolutely the biggest subject in this whole field of stress and psychoneuroimmunology. The biggest subject the most important one, the most controversial, the one that really, really dominates some folk wisdom about psychoneuroimmunology, what does stress have to do with cancer? And that will be the subject of the next lecture.